Hey, so looks like that intro video was from two years ago. The bones of that are still good, but I do want to update it to reflect what's happening here in uh, April of uh, 2021. All right, so update video. Uh, what's happened since then? <clears throat> I'm trying to remember the exact order of events. Uh, bottom line, who was it? Um, so we know, right, that Trump got uh, Kavanaugh onto the court, right, because of that failure of Obama to fill that open seat um, with Merrick Garland, right? That didn't work out because Senate Majority Leader at the time, Mitch McConnell, totally blocked it for about a year. Kind of shitty, but definitely legal, right? Senate doesn't have to provide its consent. It can deny it. That's what happened. Uh, so that's one for Trump, right? A, a holdover from the Obama era. Uh, next, right? And I hope I'm getting the order right. It might be reversed. Either way, it's, it amounts to the same damn thing at the end of the day. Gorsuch comes onto the court, right? Because uh, I'm not going to have I'm probably reversing this. I think Gorsuch was the replacement for the empty seat. And then I think uh, Kavanaugh was for the, uh, when uh, Justice Kennedy retired. Either way, right, Trump gets pretty quickly uh, two, two seats on the court, uh, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch. And now, now, both of those were replacing Republicans who had either died or left, right? Uh, so in that sense, no huge deal, although we would say, uh, given especially that I think it was Kavanaugh replaced Kennedy, that was kind of a, a deal because Kennedy was a Reagan-era, more moderate Republican, um, Kavanaugh, definitely a, a more Trumpian conservative Republican. So you go for, right from a kind of a moderate Republican to a conservative Republican. That moves the court a little bit to the right. Still, though, right with the status quo of five Republicans, four Democrats at that point. Uh, once Kennedy retired. Uh, and then, you know, right, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passes away right at the very end of Trump's presidency. You know, Democrats had wanted her to retire much earlier when Obama was still early days and Democrats still controlled the Senate. She didn't. That's her prerogative, you know, and she's legendary. But she holds on, right, like so many until the bitter end. And she leaves the court by dying. Not that unusual. But in this case, right, for Democrats, damn near catastrophic. Because now... Uh, Right, McConnell, of course, right, pushes that through. Don't get in, don't get me into the whole right. Uh, McConnell arguing under Obama. If there's an open seat before an election, even if it's a year before an election, we have to keep it open to let the people decide who the next president is. Right? Yeah, and that, that all goes away when when the, when the opposite situation happens, right? Well, I think we all understand what's going on there. It's it's it's. Uh, just sheer political maneuvering for partisan advantage by any means necessary. All right, so, so right, Ginsburg dies right at the end of Trump's presidency, just before an election, and of course, boom, man, McConnell makes sure that goes through damn fast, and uh, we get Amy Coney Barrett, right, in a trice, replacing Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You're replacing a liberal Democrat with a deeply conservative Trumpian Republican. Wow. And now it's six to three, right? Now the partisan lineup, six Republicans, three Democrats. That has really changed things for the court. That's the big deal that's been happening there. Um, Republican, to say that Trump got more than his share would be an understatement. But that's the way the cookie crumbles. Democrats are going to have to suck it up. Uh, part of that was shitty, right? Uh, McConnell keeping that seat open for almost a year under Obama. That was shitty, but legal. Had never been done before. Um, and that gave Trump an extra one, basically, right? And then he got two more because of a retirement and a death. Well, you know, sometimes that happens for you as president, sometimes it doesn't. So he got a little lucky there. It is what it is, right? So now we have the Supreme Court that by a margin of two to one, is uh, Republican. That doesn't sit too well with Democrats. It doesn't strike Democrats right as entirely fair or even representative of the country, which is 50-50 at best. 
Uh, so, but it is what it is. All right. So, so now we're going to start to see a, a Supreme Court with a strong Republican majority. What are they going to do? Well, two things that strike me. That's one. Uh, one thing, right, is um, the court now is in a position, if they desire, uh, to do some real ch changes, enact some real changes in, in, in Supreme Court jurisprudence. Uh, abortion rights, I think that's on the agenda. Uh, they have at least five votes to overturn Roe, possibly six, depending on Chief Justice John Roberts, who's a Republican, that's the second thing, Republican John Roberts, right, put there, under, I think, by W. Bush. Uh, he's, he's, he was somewhat moderate to begin with, and I think because his colleagues are increasingly further to the right and Trumpian, I think he's been moving more towards the Democrats a bit, right? One of those surprise justices, maybe. Just when we thought the era of surprise justices was over, it's back. Uh, Roberts seems to be moving a bit to the left. I wouldn't want to exaggerate that, but it seems significant. But again, right, that still only means three Democrats plus Roberts is four. You need five votes to win. So ultimately, conservative Republicans are still in the driver's seat on this, you know, on this Supreme Court. Um, yes, and any number of things could change now with this very conservative Supreme Court. Uh, at worst, conservatives hold a five to four edge, at best six to three, if, if Roberts sides with the conservatives, which he often does. So, yeah, tough times for the Democrats on that front, no question about it. Uh, and then related to that, because these things are all connected, right? That's why I love this stuff. It's complicated and it's connected. Is uh, right now Democrats want Stephen Breyer to retire right quick, right? While Democrats still control the Senate, barely, and control the White House, they would like to see Breyer leave the bench. He's quite old, he's a Democrat, and they don't want another Ruth Bader Ginsburg situation, right? So uh, the hope by Democrats is that Breyer will retire within the, within the next year, basically. Because, uh, you know, there's a good chance, right, Republicans retake the Senate in 2022. And so when the, when the new Senate meets in 2023, that could be one where Mitch McConnell is right back in power <laughs> and will not allow anybody to go through that Biden might nominate at any level. So, yeah, I'll be fascinated to see how that plays out. I think Breyer should do it. I think it's the right thing to do. Nobody's indispensable. I don't think you should leave the court by dying if you can retire a little bit before then. But there is a, a definite pattern of justices holding those seats uh, until the very end of, of their lifespan. Uh, so that's the good, interesting stuff that's been happening with the federal courts. And, and of course, right, as noted in the uh, slides, um, uh, Trump, not only did he get three Supreme Court justices, which is crazy in only four years, I think that might be unprecedented, maybe, uh, but uh, as well, right, he got over 200 lower federal court judges on the bench because there were 100 left over from Obama because McConnell was a jerk. <laughs> and then an additional 100 and, and more uh, under Trump. Because it turns out federal judges will leave the bench fairly often because the job's not quite as prestigious, right, as the Supreme Court. So the turnover there is, is quicker. So that means that, that Trump judges currently hold a lot of power on, on our lower federal courts, circuit courts of appeal and trial courts. And that's going to be changing, right, now that Biden's president and Democrats control the Senate. Uh, Biden has been filling the, the empty slots there, and there's been a fair number, a couple dozen already. Um, he's been filling those quickly with Democrats. So that, that'll shift it back a little bit, but Trump's imprint on the federal courts is, has been huge, just absolutely huge. I'll also note, right, increasingly, uh, presidents are choosing younger nominees, so they'll serve longer, more likely. And so all, all of Trump's people, and it's smart politics, uh, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, uh, Barrett are all quite young for a, for a Supreme Court justice. Uh, and um, they'll be on the bench for decades, probably. And that's a way for a president, right, to extend their influence. It's a fair question. It, it always has been. Should we have term limits? I think every other democracy has term limits. I'd like to see term limits. I think 10 years is frickin' plenty. 12 or 15 at most. And then, you know, let somebody else have a try. Because sometimes you end up with a really old court, and they're just, they, they've dated themselves. 
and uh, they're anachronistic and they're out of touch and they get cranky and uh, they're increasingly ineffective. But you know, if they want to stay there, they can. I I'd like to see term limits, get some new blood on the bench regularly. It would also give each president a certain number of nominees rather than it's random depending upon who dies or who retires kind of a thing. But that, that's something I, I think would be good. I don't think there's much question about it. It would be good for our democracy. But simultaneously, it's never going to happen. So it's in the, in the realm of fantasy, effectively. But we are the only democracy in the world that has life tenure for federal judges and justices. I'm not sure it's justified. But, you know, once it's there, it's very hard to change. All right. Uh, that's good stuff with the federal courts. Um, now, all of what I've just said being said, uh, the court, now this is before Barrett joined and, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg left, uh, the court did issue a number of surprisingly liberal decisions, right? Like that Title VII decision on the rights of transgender individuals vindicated right by the court under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That was very surprising and definitely not conservative. Uh, and they've is issued a, sh a few others, like on abortion, where, they, where they've maintained the course, a sort of a moderate approach on abortion, maintaining choice, although allowing the states to do a fair amount of regulation. Uh, but, right, since then, things have shifted, because Roberts was often the decisive out there, although not always. Uh, but now with Ginsburg gone and Barrett on, those, those liberal surprise decisions might might be a relic of the past. We'll, we'll see. Uh, and there has been talk right by Democrats, just blowing off steam at this point, of expanding the court's membership to 11 from 9. That's certainly entirely legal uh, under the Constitution. <clears throat> Article 1 language, Congress has the authority to set the number of justices on the court. It hasn't always been 9. I think it started out at five and then it went to seven and now it's nine. Been nine for a long time. But that's not written in stone. That's highly malleable and plastic. Um, so constitutionally, it's fine to do that. Politically, it's seen as inappropriate, right? Because it's been nine for so long. And it's always about partisanship. So that's nothing new. Uh, but Democrats are frustrated, right? They feel like they, you know, they get most of the votes every national election and they, and they only have three justices on the Supreme Court. That kind of rubs them the wrong way. And they feel like the court should more broadly reflect the American population politically, and it doesn't right now. Um, so they like to see the court right moved to 11. 11. Uh, this is Spinal Tap reference. They'd like to see the court move to 11, which would give right Biden, right off the top, two nominees both Democrats, obviously, right? And then the court would be six Republicans, five Democrats. Look, Republicans would still control the court, uh, but Democrats would have, you know, five instead of three. Uh, so, but that, that's an interesting idea. I think if the, if the Democrats had picked up more Senate seats in November, they, they would have maybe done that. But as it is, right, they only have 50 seats in the Senate. And you got some conservative Democrats there, like Joe Manchin out of West Virginia, John Tester in Montana, Kristen Cinema out of Arizona, they're never going to go along with that. So that won't happen. Just like we're not going to be adding the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico as states. Now, had the Democrats won more seats in November, maybe. That's, again, perfectly legal to do that. That's how Nevada got in, right? <laughs> um, but politically, that's not going to happen uh, with only 50 seats in the Senate. Too many, too many conservative Democrats who will not uh, go that far. Maybe rightly so. It's a judgment call. Um, all right. So uh, Nevada's courts, what to say there? I covered all in the slides. Uh, I would say this, that, right, that, that recent Nevada Supreme Court election, I think one of the seats was unopposed. That happens pretty regularly. Uh, Chris Pickering, I believe, was the incumbent. She got reelected as chief judge. Um, so that was not an interesting election. Uh, I mean, that was decided in the primary once she was the only one uh, running. Um, or maybe she won so overwhelmingly that she didn't have to run in the general. I forget the details, but at the end of the day, uh, she was essentially unopposed and got reelected. Uh, uninteresting in a way, right? Uh, but but the, the interesting race was Ozzy Fumo versus Douglas Herndon. I know it's a nonpartisan 
election, right? Judicial elections are always nonpartisan. Back east, like in Pennsylvania, where I grew up, they're, they have judicial elections and they're partisan. Old school, baby. I, I think that's the way to do it. So we know what we're getting by the label, quite honestly. Call me a cynic. Um, but many of the Western states that were formed later, uh, they went with what was seen as a more progressive approach. I don't know if it is or not, but nonpartisan, right? Try to take the politics out of the courts. I don't think it does that. I think it masks the politics of the courts for we, the people, the voter. We hardly know who we're getting, right? Anyway, all this is to say, Douglas Herndon uh, is a Republican. That's cool. Moderate Republican, a very good judge. You know, he has a good resume for the most part. He, he did some prosec prosecutorial misconduct many years ago. That's a stain on his record. But overall, you'd say he's been a good judge at a lower, I think he's been a district court judge for, for had been a district court judge for a while. He was well rated by his peers and by attorneys appearing before him. Uh, versus uh, Ozzy Fumo, kind of a rough and tumble politician, liberal Democrat, uh, defense attorney. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so Herndon wins that race, right, in November. And uh, Fumo goes down in defeat by, by a good margin, I think. Um, uh, so that's worth knowing, right? Uh, and also notable about that, right, is over a million dollars was spent. Most of that by Herndon, who had the backing of the establishment, because he's an establishment guy. I have no problem with that. So he had the backing of the legal establishment. And then Ozzy Fumo, he's seen as more of a renegade, super liberal defense attorney. He was not able to raise nearly as much money. I think it was... Uh, I think Herndon outraised Fumo like three to one. Uh, but over, overall, right, over a million dollars between the two of them. I think that's maybe, maybe the most expensive Nevada Supreme Court race ever. Probably because of inflation, probably because money's becoming more significant in politics in general and in judicial races in particular in Nevada and elsewhere. So that raises that issue, right? Should we have judicial elections with private funding by law firms and corporations who have skin in the game. It's always fair to ask that. It's uncomfortable but fair to ask that question, right? Uh, should we be permitting law firms and corporations with a vested interest in who gets elected to contribute money to candidates for the Nevada Supreme Court, the Nevada Court of Appeals, and so on? Um, so it's a fair question in, in all states where they do that, which is many. So I'd raise that, right? Because uh, honestly, if, I, if I'm a law firm and, and I'm representing a client before the Nevada Supreme Court, and I know that my opponent on the other side has donated money, m donated money to some of the people on the court, and I haven't, I'm not going to feel too good about that. <laughs> um, you know, if, if I'm litigating against a corporation that's given a lot of money in judicial contributions over the years to members of the court. Again, I'm not going to feel too good about that. Now, what is it Justice Kennedy used to say? If not the substance of impropriety, at the very least, right, it, 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 it creates the uh, appearance of impropriety. And, and when the judiciary, right, confidence in its, in its uh, independence is really important. So even if it's only the appearance of impropriety, that, that enough, that, that alone, right, is enough to raise questions about should we permit this practice? Well, I've talked way too much. I do apologize. That's a pretty, pretty thorough update of federal and state courts uh, circa April of uh, 2021. Thank you for, uh, for bearing with me.